Hey guys, and welcome to Vegan Booty Talks. I have a guest with me today. She is animal rights activist, vegan YouTuber, podcast host, and U.S. campaign manager of Generation Vegan. Welcome to the show, Jamie Logan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to let this vegan booty talk, let me tell you. <laughs> tell me a little bit more about yourself. Let our listeners know you better. For sure. Yeah. So I am first and foremost, an animal rights activist. I'm based in New York City and I do all sorts of actions from demos to disruptions. You might know me from the coach runway show. And I also create educational content on my podcast, on my YouTube channel. And I also work for a company called Generation Vegan, where we do all sorts of filming and we do a lot of pressure campaigns on organizations to try and get them to address whether it's a plant-based food system, address uh, animal rights in some way, shape or form. You might know Generation Vegan from our former campaigns a uh, million dollar vegan is what we were called before. And we asked the Pope to go vegan for Lent. Uh, we also just most recently asked Prince William to add a plant-based category to his, his Earthshot prize. So wow, those are just- that's, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. So those are just some of the uh, demos and campaigns that I work on. It's amazing. I saw your last one in the fashion show. Can you tell us about this one? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So I crashed the coach runway, or as I like to say, I made an appearance and I wanted to get people thinking about leather. And so my friend Sasha and I got up on stage. She was basically body painted. She was naked except for her underwear. And she was supposed to represent a skinned animal. And I had a sign behind her that said, coach leather kills. And this made headlines. I mean, we got this message in Vogue, on CNN, in People Magazine, Daily Mail, The Guardian, The Independent. So it really went international. And actually, an article just came out today on, in Vogue saying was something like, the was the runway crasher the main character of Fashion Week? <laughs> oh, my God. That's yeah. so cool. I saw that and I saw other things that you've done. And I was thinking to ask you about like a behind the scene process. Like, let's say with this fashion show, when I saw that video, I was like, how you freaking did that? Like, you have to get there somehow, bring your friend whole in the, you know, in the, you know, like a painting body thing, like how you guys organize all of that. Well, a good magician never reveals their secrets, yeah, <laughs> but I, I can tell you it was a lot of planning and it was a lot of acting skills and finessing to make our way in there for sure. It was not easy. <laughs> wow. Wow. So let me go back a little bit in the history of your biography and plant-based diet. How long are you vegan? Yeah. So I've been vegan for a almost six years now. I went vegan in 2018 for Veganuary. It was a challenge and I was vegetarian before that. And my friend said to me, she's like, I'm going to try going vegan for a month. And I was like, Ooh, that sounds interesting. Let me just try it. I mean, how hard can it be? Because I already don't eat meat. And within that month, I just started learning about the dairy and the egg industries. And I felt so much better. And I was like, well, I'm just going to keep on doing this. So I've been vegan ever since. And then shortly after I got into activism. Wow. Well, that's so interesting because a lot of people who switch to plant-based diet don't even think about activism. So maybe has anything happened in your life that you felt like you have to talk about that? Mm -hmm. So it got to a point where I would see these videos of animals suffering in factory farms and slaughterhouses and I realized that if I didn't speak up or do anything about it, nothing would change. And so I wasn't sure exactly how to start speaking up at first because it's one of those things where once you get your foot in the doorway, then you start hearing about different actions that are going on, different protests. But before that, I was kind of shy. And also a lot of my friends and family would make annoying comments about veganism. And I wasn't too sure how to respond. But my cousin in California, Alex, 
had been vegan for over 13 years at the time. So she said, you have to come out and visit me. We'll do a whole weekend and I'll take you to an AV cube. And I was like, what is that? What is an AV cube? Like, I don't want to do this. I was always the type of person that was kind of go with the flow and never wanted to cause issues, which looking at me now, you're like, yeah, really? Like, we don't know her. So (laughs) I went out to go visit her in California and the AV cubes are basically where you stand with the TV screens showing the practices, standard practices in the meat, dairy, and egg industries, as well as cosmetic testing and the fashion industry and how animals are used, abused, and exploited. And you show this to passer buyers that are going by on the street. And I just remember standing there with the TV screen and looking at people's faces as they passed by. And in that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to change the world. Like I believe that by showing people this, they're all going to change. And it was a rude awakening when I shortly realized that after telling my friends and family about this, they didn't change. And then after, yeah, (laughs) yeah, after going out on the street, people weren't changing as fast as I thought they would. That to me was, is always the hardest part about being vegan is feeling that change isn't happening fast enough and that animals are suffering. So then one thing led to another. I met other activists. I started going to vigils outside of slaughterhouses. I started going to fur protests and demonstrations, doing actions with PETA. And now I have my own YouTube show and podcast where I kind of developed my own brand and style for activism, which I think really saved me because I was so angry and depressed and I just wanted to like cry all the time. And and so I think by creating my own style, I was able to find myself again and also advocate in an effective way. Yeah, that's so cool. Your story is really inspirational. But I want to ask you about re- rejection. Like I went vegan the same as you, right? One day and I was feeling the same way. Like, oh, let me tell the world. They all going to change. It's never going to happen. And I felt a lot of rejection. And then with that, I stepped in a little different field because I thought, okay, by telling people that I only feel regret. I only feel <clears throat> that they don't want to listen. Let me just step in the other way and give them an example. But I absolutely adore that you stay there. So I just wanted to ask you what's help you to don't step back and keep talking about the things that no one is going to listen to. Especially as like you said, you are not like, you know, the person like that. You are better just like be quiet and then go away. I think it was really the fact that I felt so sure of this and so confident in that this is the most kind and compassionate way of living. And you can't argue the facts of what happens to animals. It's There's no right way to do the wrong thing. And the more I learned, the further I ran and the more I wanted to speak up about this. So it was it was really hard, you know, dealing with people. But what helped me the most was actually reading Earthling Ed's um, excuses for how to combat a meat eater. I think it was like one of his free eBooks online. And I read through it and it went through every excuse a meat eater would have, whether it's, oh, but God tells us to, or you need your protein. You can't Uh do that. It was every excuse. And so I read through it to the point where I felt confident about speaking to people about these issues. And then when people would engage in conversation with me, they would realize oh, wait, she actually knows her shit. I don't really want to mess with her because ultimately they're going to have to change. You know, once I back them into a corner and I'm like, you're kind of a hypocrite. You're not really making any sense. The facts and the science are on our side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. But that's how, you know, you have to have courage to do that. You have to have passion and, you know, like a lot of power in you, like to deal with people, especially with those, like I met so many who would say, uh, I just love to eat meat and I don't Mm -hmm. care about animal suffering, which is not really like makes sense because if you show them the videos, they would not going to want to see that. Mm -hmm. So how you deal with those? Have you met people who say Mm -hmm. that? 
Yeah, those are always the hardest. And I think that's a really good way to just have an excuse to basically justify your behavior. It's like, that's the only thing that they can say that I can't really say anything back to. But what I try to do is bring people in from the health point of view or from the environmental point of view, if I see they're not necessarily connecting with the animals at first. But I think with veganism, what keeps people vegan in the long run is always the animals. You know, it's like when it's for the health, you can have a cheesecake on the weekends. It's not going to kill you. But when it's for the animals, you recognize that we don't just eat them sometimes. We want them free and alive all of the time. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I try not to waste my time too much with people that are not ready to hear the message yet because it's exhausting for me. And also, no matter what I say, they're probably not going to change until they're ready to change. So I always recommend going and talking to the people that are more so the low bearing fruits, the people that are open minded, that want to learn, that are curious or people that maybe, um, you know, just want to learn more. And I think that is the most effective way. However, when I film my videos out on the street, I will talk to anyone and everyone that will talk to me. And that's what makes the content so fun and dynamic is I am dealing with those people that are saying, oh, I just don't care. But because I'm able to edit it and post it on social media, I'm able to then send the message out that I want to send out to the public of saying like, oh, well, you know, just because somebody says I don't care doesn't necessarily just excuse them from harming another being. It's not a personal choice. They're they're perpetuating in a violent act. So, uh, you know, a child molester can say, well, I don't really care. It's, I like to do it. It doesn't make it okay. You, They yeah. still will do it, but it doesn't make it right, okay, or moral. Yeah. Have you ever like, uh, like right after your conversation convince anyone to switch to the plant-based diet? Plenty of times. Absolutely. I mean, it's always... I think people will learn more information as they go. So I've, I went plant-based, but I don't think I stopped wearing my leather shoes until maybe eight months later. I mm -hmm. just had to donate them because I just couldn't wear the skins anymore. I just, it just kind of disturbed me. But um, I think, you know, it, it's a process. And mm -hmm. the more we can recognize that veganism is... It's about doing and causing the least amount of harm as practically possible. And, you know, when you first go vegan, you may not realize that, oh, there's gelatin and gummy bears. And I always tell people, I'm like, don't beat yourself up. You're learning these yeah. products. It's it's hard to know, you know, certain wines and beers are not vegan. So it was a process for me. Um, but one story that I really sticks with me, this has happened actually a few times where I, I go to AV cubes pretty consistently now just because I find it educational. I enjoy speaking with people. I also film my content at a lot of AV cubes. And I will always remember some woman came up to me and she goes, are you Jamie? And I was like, yes, that's me. And she was like, I just want to let you know that I've been vegan ever since we last spoke. And this must have been over eight months ago. She's wow. like, you changed my life. And just to have that power to be able to, number one, extend somebody's life expectancy because they're eating healthier. Uh, that's uh, incredible. And number two, be able to spread this message and then have them be able to speak up about it and reach their circle of people is so incredible. And that's a great reminder of why I do what I do. Yeah. Wow. That's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. I love that. I feel the same way on social media when I share, you know, my plan based. And then since I switched to only working with vegan uh, athletes, I felt so much more true to myself, you know, and uh, I totally feel what you mean when someone is like, you know, coming to you and say, you changed my life. That's the best feeling you can have. That's so powerful. Mm -hmm. but speaking about your show, I want to know a little more about how you came up with the show. How does that happen? Because as I understand, this is your primary job right now, right? That's how you make your money. It's one of my jobs. I 
don't necessarily make a ton of money off of it. My primary job would be Generation Vegan, where I'm the U.S. campaign manager. Mm. Like that's what I like do most of the day. But my show is something that I do on the side, and that kind of came about as a complete accident. So I have to backtrack a few years ago because I was working at a film company called Cave Light Films straight out of college. And we made six short documentaries that told stories in the animal rights movement that ended up reaching over 100 million people. And it got the animal rights message mainstream. I mean, we made one about live animal wet markets in New York City during the pandemic, while everybody's pointing the finger at China, that got over 10 million views. We did another one about the fashion industry. We did one about Regan Russell, the activist that was trucked down by a livestock driver and killed. We did one about a religious sacrifice called Kaporos that happens on the public streets of New York City. So we're, we told these stories in an entertaining way uh, that also got the information out there. So my boss, Jordan, at the time said to me, he goes, you're going to the AV Cube tonight, right? And I was like, yeah, do you want to come? He goes, yeah, why don't we film it? Let's just see how the conversations go. So I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, let's do it. And so I do have a little bit of a film background. I studied journalism and media in college and then working at the film company, I did everything from editing to shooting to producing, doing interviews, that kind of thing. And so he came and filmed this AV cube. And when we got back to his apartment and was looking over the footage, we were cracking up at how ridiculous and funny these conversations were. Now, to clarify, there was nothing funny about what was happening to the animals. The funny part was just the awkwardness from myself and from the people that I was talking to. So we thought, huh, let's just edit something together with this and just see where it goes. And that's how Jamie's Corner was founded and born was just through an accident of filming this and then realizing, hmm, maybe there's something here. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. I love your content. It's Thank amazing. You. It's, it's it's just like the fun way to get to, you know, attention to people, which is the hardest part in social media. And mm-hmm. I love the show. And it's 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 amazing how you be able to make the brand of what you love and what you're passionate about. So it's a great example for anyone out there who want to pursue a different career. You know, what did you do before that? Thank you so much for your kind words about the show. Um, before the show, I was really angry and upset and I was going to slaughterhouse vigils and crying my eyes out and feeling hopeless and helpless and I would you know write on my parents milk cartons not your mom not your milk which worked but besides the point Mm -hmm. I just really I, I was losing myself I was losing that fun easygoing go with the flow girl that I always was and people that knew me from before they were like who is this lunatic and I wasn't relating to the non-vegans and I, therefore I don't know how effective I was and as activists I think we always have to reassess are my actions effective am I getting the message across in the way that I want to. And so, yeah, I, and I sort of started running with the Jamie's corner thing. And, you know, one thing that I realized about producing content and putting out content, it, it is a lot of work. It's a lot more work than I thought it would be. And so I'm finally now at that point where I have the freedom and flexibility to go out and film more, more flexibility to edit. Cause I'm not at the film company where I was working, like, you know, sometimes 10 hour days so gen v has been such a dream come true and they're just it's such a supportive team that's the other thing is like i always recommend to people support your get a support system and and surround yourself with people that are like-minded that has what has been the most helpful to me in this vegan journey is making close vegan friends yeah you're right but sometimes it's really hard to do uh, maybe isn't you know any advice to someone out there you know you can listen to shows just like that you can uh, follow people on instagram but how to find vegan people in your state in your corner right in your whatever small town where you live is there any mm-hmm. idea you have about that well if you go to a deserted island 
you might find one there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know that. Um, well, being that I'm in New York City, we really do have such a strong team here. And I was able to go to some AV cubes and then you meet people, you go out to dinner, you talk, you keep in touch, and then you plan more actions together. So I am a little spoiled in that sense that we have such a, a strong activist team yeah. here. But... I used to live in New York. It was much more easier. <laughs> yes. And we're also, we, you know, we don't drive, we can take trains everywhere. So it's people are closer together, I think, but it's not to say that there's not other vegans in your area. I highly recommend using social media to find those people. Facebook groups are a really great way of getting in touch. Also, you can Go to your local vegan restaurants if you have any. Use the app Happy Cow to find vegan restaurants and then you might meet people there. But be the change. You can start things yourself. Even if it means you go outside a supermarket with a sign by yourself and you do something, that is, I, I really applaud that. I, I don't think we need to wait around for, you know, to find people. I think we need to act now in whatever way that is for you, whether it's wearing a t-shirt with a message on it, whether it's starting your own podcast or show, creating music that has a message in there, speaking up about it, doing presentations at schools. Like we need more vegans to get active. I'm All of us love to go to, you know, great vegan restaurants and eat and hang out and do potlucks, but the animals don't need more potlucks they need liberation and they need uh, our voices yeah you're right oh my god i got so inspired right now to do something like this yeah <laughs> you're just such a sweetheart you are so much inspirational wow thank you for that uh in the side note i wanted to ask you also because you are so experienced with talking to people and I think you are, you know, have a lot of questions, feedback from some who are not vegan, but they may have some misconceptions or mm -hmm. myths about vegan yeah. diet. So what are those common myths about veganism that you may heard from people? And, um, you know, maybe you can break them down. <laughs> Oh gosh, there's so many. I mean, just go to my Instagram page and as soon as the bacon comments start rolling in, I'm like, yes, I reached the people I wanted to reach. Yeah. So before I get to the misconceptions, I do just want to say that there are three stages of truth. And the first stage is opposition and resistance. The second stage is violent oppression. And the third stage is finally acceptance. And what we're seeing right now is people's cognitive dissonance at play. We're seeing them try and justify their actions and basically make themselves feel better about what they do to animals by making these stupid comments. I can't tell you how many times I have gotten the same comments over and over and over again. It's like the same five. One of them is that vegans kill more animals than meat eaters because when the tractors come and plow the fields for the vegetables, they think that the mice and the insects are dying and that it's more than the farmed animals. And my first question to that, what that I would ask back to them is, well, what are the 80 billion farmed animals eating? Mm -hmm. They have to eat a lot of soy, a lot of vegetable, a lot of grain, right? So those fields are plowed. So veganism is not about being perfect. I can't say for sure that my tofu didn't kill an insect, right? But it did reduce suffering in the fact that it's not funding an industry that intense, it intentionally breeds animals into existence to kill them. There have been studies as well that show that the mice don't just sit around when there's tractors about to plow them over. They usually hear them from far away. They have pretty good hearing and, and smell, and so they are able to run. Um, that's for one. And for two, our farming systems and practices are only going to get better over time. So we can look towards greenhouses. We can look towards cultivated meat, precision fermentation. There's other ways about going about farming. However, there's no right way to kill an animal that doesn't want to die. So the meat industry, it's like, well, these people are so concerned about lives lost. What about the 80 billion lives lost? in the meat industry every year. 
So it's this, it's this Joe Rogan put out this nonsense that I feel like I just have to copy and paste, copy and paste. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's, you know, one of them that's super common. Yeah, I heard that one too. It's just ridiculous. It doesn't make sense for me because I think it's one of those, you know, um, some of those like uh, things that is like doesn't make sense if you truly think about how can this kill more more animals than you go in there and buying that animal in the store. Well, they're not only responsible for the meat and the animals that they're eating for meat, but they're also responsible for all the crops then that that then that animal it, they're also responsible for all of the crops that that animal ate. Yeah, yeah. You can't just look at the end product. You have to look at the supply chain as well. So I don't know if they simply like have not thought it through enough or if they're just trying to be silly. I don't know. But it's it's exhausting to constantly go through these comments like I almost wish there was like an an alert that came up on our iPhones like when you see the flash floods that just says vegans don't kill more animals than meat eaters and here's why (laughs) Uh, yeah that would be cool Uh, by the way what are your thoughts on the future of veganism and the change it you may think can bring to our planet so I am hopeful for change. And I think as activists, we have to be because otherwise, why are we fighting so hard, right? So I think that with new technologies like cultivated meat, which is basically taking cells from animals and growing meat products in a lab, I think that is the future. If people don't want to stop eating meat, but they can eat the meat from cells instead of living, breathing animals that fought for their lives and that that is fine by me that is great I personally feel so great on a plant-based diet I don't ever see myself eating that or wanting me I just don't crave it at all anymore so I think that that is definitely part of the future and necessary if we want a planet to live on I also think you know we are growing as a movement even six years ago when I went vegan, we didn't have as much access in fast food restaurants. A lot of people knew what vegetarianism was, but they didn't know what veganism was. So we are starting to see that societal shift. And I am not sure if we will have total animal liberation in our lifetime, but surely in our children or our grandchildren's lifetime. Yeah, I truly believe in that too. And I think it's also, if we're looking on the climate change on our planet, on the ocean, is a lot of like things that we clearly see that it has to change in order to planet just survive in a couple of years, not even like 30, you know what I mean? Like with those new films that coming out, I'm just so happy to see that because I've been vegan for eight years and I never seen those before. So truly believe in change too, which is inspiring. And um, yeah, it feels like for me, in some point, we all have to go vegan. It's not like we want to, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, those documentaries are really what did it in for me and and what finalized my decision on going vegan. And I think the more that we can get this mainstream and the more that we can just expose and uncover how horrible these industries are from what they do to humans, what they do to animals, what they're doing to the environment, and also our health in the long term, then it's just... It seems like common sense to make the world go vegan or plant-based. And in 2023, there is no lack of plant-based alternatives. There's no lack of vegan, uh, sustainable leathers and materials. There's so many more options. Like we're not living in 1850 trying to survive. We, most of us have the ability to make that switch. Yeah, I agree with you. So much easier to be vegan nowadays. <laughs> Just so easy. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like I can talk to you forever, but we have some time limits. So I wanted to ask you uh, an advice for someone who maybe wanted to switch to plant based diet. What's the easiest way they can do that? And then the second um, part of your advice is maybe someone who is already plant-based, but just wanted to spread the message, do more uh, of activism. Like what would you suggest for them? Definitely. So I try to tell people, you don't have to change anything of what you're eating. If you like your burgers, if you like your hot dogs, if you like your ravioli, we have all of that. 
Nowadays, there's absolutely no sacrifice. There are such incredible, tasty plant-based alternatives that you can still eat everything that you're eating except a vegan version of it. So you got to experiment. You'll go into the grocery store. You'll try one brand. Eh, you may not like it so much. Okay, try another brand. The beauty of it is that there's not just one option here. There's many options. So just like you might go into the supermarket and buy your animal-based products, there's going to be certain brands that you don't like as much and certain brands that you like more. So now you just reach your hand over into a different section of the aisle, get the plant-based alternative and start reading through ingredients. You should be reading through ingredients regardless. You know, when you actually see what goes into a lot of the foods, it's really, it's a long list of ingredients and it's pretty disturbing and atrocious. And so you should be reading through it and you might come across milk. You might come across eggs and you might say, okay, I'm not going to buy this today. So that's my biggest piece of advice. And I took it in steps. My one regret is that I didn't do it sooner, but for some people you might feel overwhelmed and ultimately we want you in this for the long run. So if you have to say, okay, I'm going to cut out red meat first, then I'm going to cut out chicken, then fish, then dairy, then eggs. That is what I did. But I again, recommend going vegan sooner if possible. And then the second part of your question, hi buddy, my, my foster cat, the second part of your question, um, was uh remind me if anyone already vegan and they wanted to kind of speak more about that uh become an activist and maybe spread out the message what would you suggest them to do i would suggest definitely trying to watch some of earthling ed's or joey carbstrong's videos even some of mine if you'd like to see how they are speaking to people and to start getting comfortable with what those rebuttals are and then practice them, practice them. So that way, when you're, you know, in the, in one of the AV cubes or you're ready to start doing activism and speaking up, you feel confident and comfortable talking about these topics. It really just is, it's really just practice. (laughs) She's, she's a lot. Yeah, people who don't watch us only listen us. She has an amazing cat and it feels like she wants or he is it is a girl or boy? It's a girl. I'm fostering her and I yeah. love her, but you can't train cats to not come into the interview. And what she does is she has to stick her ass at the camera. Yeah. <laughs> and I was on a work call actually this morning, and my boss is just like, Oh, there's a cat butt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, I have the same thing. I have foster kitten and now she, oh. you know, uh, same thing. I do my uh, podcast or I do something like, I don't know if you saw, I was walking to the door and getting back with my computer because she just wants to come inside in my apartment, like in my uh, room where I do uh-huh. work. And then when she's inside, she want to get out. So she constantly like, you know, making the sounds to come in or come out. <laughs> the queens of the imp- apartment. Yeah. Basically, yeah. anytime I get on a call, it's like sh- her ass just has to be facing <laughs> the camera. So yeah. at least we have a blur on here. We have a little bit of a sensor. So that's good. <laughs> um, But yeah, I would recommend looking towards, you know, watching some of the other activists that are already active and speaking up and just getting comfortable with the topics and th- and questions that non- non-vegans might have. And then from there, I would start testing the waters, see what you're comfortable with. If you would have asked me 10 years ago, if I would have been crashing runway shows, speaking up about leather, I would have said, you're crazy. But it, it got to the point where these industries don't want to listen and we have to take things to the next level to get them to wake up and to get media attention. And I just, I've kind of graduated towards bigger type of actions, but you might not be comfortable with arrest or actions that might be high risk. And that is totally fine. I think everybody needs to start somewhere and For me, AV cubes were super easy and really fun to get involved with. For the first six months, I just stood in the the cube. And then afterwards, once I felt more confident, I started speaking to ongoers. Yeah, that's so cool. You know, thank you for giving that advice. Uh, Even for me, it's valuable because I do, you know, wanted to do more activism more talking about the problem i choose to 
go through the different perspective and give people and you know an example so i look great with my fitness and then they come to me asking questions what do you do you know and i shock them by saying you know i grow all my muscle plant base because i actually don't eat meat from i was six so that's kind of my you know perspective on that so i make people ask me the questions not i make the questions to them but I think we all, all vegans who listen to the show can, you know, speak up a little more and mm-hmm. shine when there's a rejections coming, because sometimes, you know, I just don't want to deal with those people, just like you said, like they are mm-hmm. not ready to hear the message, but at the same time, how they will be ready if no one is speak about that. So thank you for being that change and example for a lot of us. I love that approach. I And I think that for somebody like you, that works really, really well. I mean, I, I'm definitely not like super muscular or anything. I'm more like on the lanky side, I guess, but I always right. have been. I, I mean, I always, but it's like funny how when you go vegan, it's like all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, I have to be a walking billboard. Like, let me get my act together, <laughs> you yeah. know? And people, people do come to me. They're like, oh wow. Like how is your skin so clear or, yeah. you know, things, how do you have so much energy is what I get a lot. And I'm like, plant-based, I'm vegan. You know, it yeah. really, really helps. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Oh my God. I helped so many athletes switch to plant-based diet and they felt so much more energy Mm -hmm. and then recovery after the workouts and become so much easier. So that's for sure. And then skin change. Yeah. is If anyone listens to this and you have a acne or skin problem, I deal with that. I used to have a crazy acne. And just like I mentioned, I didn't eat meat from I was six, but I ate dairy and that Mm -hmm. was for my skin, you know? So complete plant-based diet is actually like really a change a lot because if you just reduce one thing, just like you said, you can start from there, but eventually just, yeah, save the animals is to say it's the message that we want to get people to because in my experience, the same, I have a different client who comes to me that they want to switch to the plant-based diets for the different reasons, you know, mm-hmm. some of those are health reasons as a nutritionist. I help people from the health perspective to switch to the plant-based diet, but eventually those who are stick with that is those who are make the change to save the animals. Mm-hmm. Only do this for health. Eventually you're going to question yourself and you could like stick to that forever. Yeah. It's super interesting to me how somebody can look at a slaughterhouse video and not feel empathy for the animals. Because as soon as I saw that stuff, I mean, it crushed me you see these innocent vulnerable beings that did nothing wrong just being brutally murdered and that to me was just horrific and then to have see somebody else watch it and not feel the same way is scary um and so that's why I really do think the future lies in cultivated meat because it's like people are addicted to these products, literally, quite literally addicted to them. Their gut microbiome is used to breaking down animal products. And so being that they're so addicted to these products, it's like an addict. You keep going back until you break that cycle and you're like, no, this is wrong and, and feel it ethically. Right. So that's why I'm like cultivated meat needs to come sooner. And I'm trying to put more focus and effort into that for sure. Yeah, I think you agree. That's definitely definitely an addiction. But what I realize I have to add that when someone is watching those videos, what I see, they feel compassion. They feel bad. They don't like to see that. But they don't make that clear connection that you and I make about this, what you have on your plate because if someone Mm -hmm. on the plate that that animal without cooking right without taking skin and all the stuff out no one is gonna want to eat that so Mm -hmm. somehow people lost the connection between what you see what's happened to that animal is what in your plate just prepared place it nicely with the spices and some vegetables on the top right so Mm. that's what's happened that's like you know like a clear connection break for some reason of, wow, that's what people like. It's almost like they see that and they're like, yeah, that's so bad, but I don't do that. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? But what is on your plate is that's what they did. He's like, no, that they did. I just eat this beautiful piece of whatever in my plate. 
Such a good point. And even if they do feel bad, they don't want to necessarily always admit to it right on the spot. Sometimes it takes a few days or even months or years for them to process it. But we can be confident in the fact that a seed was planted. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, thank you so much for your time today. I feel like I can talk to you forever, just like I said, but I have to kind of wrap it up. Before I let you go, can you tell us a little more how people can find you if they wanted to ask any more questions or just follow your you know, activism journey? Definitely. So, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I am very excited to hear what people thought about the podcast and I'd love to answer any more questions. If people have, you can just follow me on Instagram at... It's Jamie's Corner. That's I-T-S, Jamie's Corner. My personal page is It's Jamie Logan. Sometimes I don't see all the messages on the It's Jamie's Corner one. So I tell people like, you know, if I don't answer, message me on my personal one. Uh, But yeah, and you can listen to the podcast. Just go to itsjamiescorner.com and you can see some of the podcasts listed on there. It's also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, my YouTube channel, Jamie's Corner. Yeah, I will all uh, I will add all of that in the description down below, guys, so you can easily find that. I love your podcast. I hope to be a guest on your podcast one day. So yes. thank you for what you're doing and keep going, girl. This has really changed the world. It's reaching to the people that needs to hear that. And you, as I said, just some great examples for all our like all those shiny vegans out there that you can speak up and doesn't mean you have to go just like you on social media and make the videos. Even if you speak speak up in your small community, Mm -hmm. in your family, in the circle of your friends and stop being that shine vegan who are actually scary to talk about that and then quietly eat the vegetables, you know, on the Mm -hmm. corner because we all been there, but this is Mm -hmm. not making the difference. And you know what, guys? Have the courage to be disliked. As an activist, you have to get over the fact that not everybody's going to agree with you and not everybody's going to like you. And even when those comments come rolling in, just handle it with grace and kindness as best as you can. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. And I hope to hear you soon again. Maybe we're going to do this again. Who knows? Yes. And thank you guys for listening. Bye-bye. Bye.